Wayne County with a big decision to make. Is this going to be a jail or a soccer stadium? And the governor gets his incentive package through Lansing, but does it now help land a really big fish? Today is Sunday, July 16, 2017, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Again, no slowdown in the news tsunami out of Washington. It moved with the president to France for a while, uh, but we're going to catch up with a number of other issues closer to home today. Of course, big news came on Friday with the parole announcement for Rick Wershey, long better known as White Boy Rick. But we're going to talk development today. Wayne County Executive Warren Evans appears to now have all the information he's going to get and now has to make a huge decision on the dynamic of the eastern part of downtown Detroit. Does he go ahead and restart work? on that disastrous jail project, or does he take the Gilbert and Gora's option and swap that land uh, for a, a grand scale development and let them build a new jail and court complex north and east of the current prime location. Now recently, John Gallagher of the Free Press took the unusual step for him of urging Evans on one of the options. John is part of our roundtable this morning. We'll find out why he thinks it's become a clear choice. Meanwhile, at the sports stadium taking shape a few blocks away, a lot of criticism this week as Red Wings fans learned that it won't be the winged wheel on top of the Little Caesars Arena. It'll be what else? Little Caesar. Is that a bait and switch or just the spoils that go with writing the check for naming rights? We'll talk about that too. Also, as the state tries to attract a breathtaking number of jobs from Foxconn, the governor and the mayor now have their good jobs incentive package through the legislature. Does that tilt the table now in Michigan's favor? And a little later on, a conversation I've been wanting to have for some time, Arthur Jemison here to talk about what's really happening and what still really needs to happen in Detroit's neighborhoods. All today on Flashpoint. Got a lot of things I want to get to with this morning's roundtable. Good to have with me Daniel Howes, columnist from the Detroit News, former Detroit City Councilwoman uh, Sheila Cockrell, and a columnist from the Detroit Free Press, John Gallagher. And John, I want to start with you because this was a really interesting uh, piece you wrote to me a couple weeks ago now. Uh, and we're getting closer to Warren Evans making his decision on whether it's going to be, uh, to say jail or soccer is a, a vast oversimplification. But uh, even though you've written as a columnist often, this really felt pointed to me to hear you come out and say, look, this has to be the decision. He's got to go with Dan Gilbert. Uh, why did you feel so strongly? Uh, well, I think if you line them both up, you get um, uh, Gilbert's proposal versus the Walsh construction, which are almost the same financially, but you get a lot more. You get the whole criminal justice complex plus all the economic development stuff, whether it's a soccer stadium or not. And so you get, you know, the money's about the same. You get a billion dollars or some huge amount of economic development. It seems like like a no-brainer, I think, to a lot of us. But Warren Evans has to do what he has to do. Well, so. some people are still troubled by that um, sort of cost realization uh, calculation that Gilbert uh, has added in this, which seems uh, difficult to measure or predict. Well, he's pulled back on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that's no longer there. It's not there at all. It's not right. there at okay. all now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he's moved the site a little bit, a yes, couple blocks north. Right, right, um, right. A couple of wrinkles. The, the county has to buy the site from the city. It's a, now a bus maintenance site. Mm -hmm. um, but nothing seems insurmountable. And so if you, if you line up the numbers, you line up uh, what you'd rather have downtown on that site, seems pretty clear to me that uh, Gilbert's proposal makes more sense. And your thoughts on it? I agree with John. Um, I, I thought that from the beginning. Uh, it, and to your point about uh, uh, the cost equalization, they did pull back on that, but they put more emphasis on, uh, on paid parking and their mm -hmm. ability to operate paid parking, which I think was a way to kind of fill in that, uh, make the numbers work. I don't think there's any question which way they need to go here. I mean, the, the, the bang for the buck for the city, for the county, for the taxpayers is all there. Um, they've already lost 100, at least 150 million bucks. That money is gone. It will never come back. Yeah. There's no way they can claw it back. It's sunk cost. Um, and my read and my instinct is when I've watched Warren Evans as county executive um, since he took office is at the end of the day, I think he's probably going to do it. He's been very smart. He's been strategic in, 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 in how he's analyzed things. He's got a smart team around him, and I think they'll probably get there. And I think that's the expectation, by the way, of the Rock people. Uh, seems to be. In fact, we we've, we've saw that they've already mapped out uh, saved websites, Detroit City uh, Football Club and, and things like that. Uh, Sheila, I thought all along that uh, for if you're a county resident, if 
you've got a chance, uh, you're never going to be made whole on this right. mess. But if Warren Evans has a chance to save $5, he's kind of duty bound to do it, isn't he? I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, but I think Warren and his team, he has a, a really great team of people around him. They got to do their due diligence. They've got to be able to uh, go to the commission with having, you know, having, having done the kind of homework that you have to do in order to uh, make your case. I think the, you know, both what uh, uh, John and Dan have said, Daniel have said, uh, is, it doesn't, the numbers seem to add up and the value seems to be such that it would make the highest and best use of all the land would be to go with the uh, with the proposal. L let me let you all weigh in on this a little bit because it, once again though this bubbles up how much um, care and concern and aid we should be giving to billionaires. Uh, we saw that over the 35 million dollars that the council was voting on. Uh, John there is still a lot of people that are very troubled by um, hitching your wagon too closely and especially if it involves any exchange of money or goods from people who, to many way, people's way of thinking, can afford it themselves. Well, I suppose you would say that Dan Gilbert has delivered on a lot of his promises. Yeah. I know people are troubled by his security downtown, his heavy security presence, but he's delivered on his promises. He's, he's fixed up all these buildings that, he, that he's bought. Um, he's done a huge amount of placemaking downtown yeah, yeah. and uh, so I think he's he's earned at least some of a uh, you know benefit of the doubt on some of the stuff I don't think there's any question about, about it this I mean yeah, it, yeah. It, it's what's the alternative um, you know seven years ago and, and Sheila knows this better than any of us uh, these kind of things weren't happening and and now I think we've become so accustomed to some of this it's like uh, it'll, it'll just keep coming it'll just keep coming and it, it may or it may not but what he needs to get uh, his, be respected for what he's done, and I don't have a problem with him with him doing it. We had Sheila, though. We, we saw people showing up at uh, some of these meetings. Uh, you heard council members being lobbied really hard that this was not the way to spend the money. I don't think there was a great necessarily un, an understanding of how that money has to be spent. It's Correct. kind of earmarked for certain yes. things. But your thoughts yeah, I, from the I, council perspective? Sure. Well, having been on council for 16 years and been there when three casinos and yeah. two stadia <laughs> were built. It, to me, whether I mean this is capitalism, baby, and if you got a capitalist economy, the the way deals get struck are going to be ones that um, are, there's going to be benefits that are going to go to um, the people who are making the investment. That's mm -hmm. the nature of it. I sort of look at it this way: here's a choice: how it used to look, or how it looks now. Mm -hmm. That's not hard for me to to, to make the to make that uh, leap, if you will. And then secondly. As, as the, the greater uh, that the Gilbert organization has gotten deeper and deeper involved yeah, in the yeah. city, they're not ta they're building affordable housing. I mean, there there is there's there's a com the the that, that buyback program that people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. have been involved in. There's a I think an educational process that's going on with the, with that organization and a kind of I don't know growing it's planting its roots in the city that makes it different. And some of this financing is that that accrues to people like Dan Gilbert. Um, uh, and others is tax capture and it, you, the argument is that if you don't invest here you wouldn't have the tax it wouldn't to capture. Be there anyway. It wouldn't be there anyway. In fact we're going to get to that's what some are arguing over this new uh, gov the, the plan that the governor just got through the legislature but before we move from uh, sports stadia I want to show you this is an interesting controversy that bubbled up this past week so here is the picture of the Red Wings arena as it was first presented to us. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> here is as it is taking shape right now which some fe have felt is more more wah, wah. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the Little Caesars logo, which of course, uh, this stuff goes to the highest bidder, but maybe John, the problem here was expectation management, because that first picture was glowing. It seemed to suggest that there was going to be a digital thing that could change all the time, uh, because now we know the Pistons are going to be there as well. Well, it could be the Pistons, it could be the Red Wings, it could be whatever you wanted to put on it, and that's not quite where we are then. Right, well, that's how they described it originally. There would be a huge LED screen on yeah. top of the arena and would change all the time. Now you're going to have an LED screen wrapping around uh, the top, yeah, yes. but the, the top will remain the Little Caesars logo. And I understand why, why it's a thing on social media right now. <laughs> it I was odd, yes. I, yeah, so I personally prefer to see the ever-changing thing, but it's, it's, it's what it is, and we all have a lot more to worry about. You know, it's called Little Caesars Arena, number one. Number two, uh, the you Pist and I, I suppose, are free to bid if we'd like. Right. To right. No, number two, the Pistons were not a partner uh, when they named that arena. Yes. 
Um, so you can understand why they wouldn't want to favor one team over another. Number three, none of the major arenas in this town are named for the teams. Not Ford Anymore. Field, not Comerica Park, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, get on the list. Yes. Um, so, and fourth, I would say is, this town is great at getting angry about stupid little things. <laughs> I mean, to Sheila's point, so would you rather take what it looked like se seven or eight years ago and what it looks like today? I mean, I mean, come on. It's what social media is for. I understand. Yeah, getting Which is getting a lot about little bitty things. <laughs> we come back some bigger things, though. The uh, governor's tax uh, proposal, uh, incentive proposal, which got through the legislature. What kind of difference will it make? We'll talk about that when we continue on Flashpoint in just a minute. <laughs> Welcome back, Flashpoint. Let's move on to what happened in Lansing this past week. The governor got his package of good jobs bills through, which are aimed at targeting Sheila really big companies. In fact, they these incentives are only used if the jobs are there, if they're high paying jobs, uh, and if they have a real impact. Um, I guess the question is, this seemed to be designed uh, in the city and the state's bid to go after Foxconn, which helps build uh, iPhones. It, it, we're told it could be up to 10,000 jobs, which is an enormous right. footprint. Where do you think this all goes now? Well, I think it's an actual, it's a strategy that really is intended to um, create more strength in the, in, the, in the state's economy and in the city's economy. And it clearly, to me, it, it, it's an important initiative. Again, there's always the trade-off questions. Are, are incentives yeah. and abatements worth what they produce? Um, when my late husband was on council, we spent all of our time saying, you know, no to tax abatements um, as a matter of policy. Uh, over time, that I certainly re at council reached the point of supporting them because they were part of the only way to get some investment. It would be a tough stand to take, it yes. seems, in today's uh, environment of recruiting right, jobs. Right. Yes. So um, to me, it's. Um, I know, I know there were some folks and Republicans who held it up, but I guess mm -hmm. they made the deal and whatever needed to be done to get it, get it moving. Look, Michigan has been losing competitively to rival states, Indiana, Ohio, uh, the Carolinas, Alabama. You talk to economic developers across the state, not just in southeast Michigan, and they'll tell you that they are at a disadvantage. I, it was interesting to learn in reporting some of this that Ohio, the pot of money that their economic development arm uh, uses to incentivize companies and, and to give essentially cash incentives is funded by booze, the sale of booze. So you buy a bottle of Jack Daniels and a portion of that bottle goes into that fund that is then, so they're not taking it out of the general fund. So different states are doing different things. Yeah. Alabama is writing really big checks. Uh, Michigan is still not competitive on energy, on some forms of transportation. Uh, Indiana and Ohio have great east-west and north-south corridors. We really don't. We're basically mostly east-west, and we still can't get our bridge situation yeah, sorted yeah, out. Yeah. That is a problem. So when companies look at, at, at investments, they're not just looking at the tax issue. That's one issue. And I think one of the things they're trying to do here is say, this is a way for us to get that pot of money. We've already cut. Uh, we've already created a corporate flat corporate income tax. We've got a flat uh, personal income tax. We've cut some other taxes. So it's not like this administration for the last six or seven years hasn't done anything on tax policy. They have. Yeah. Uh, to your point too, this is only captured if it's there. This right. is uh, this is uh, the money has to be created. John, it's interesting though because the governor is not a fan. You know, we saw what happened with the film incentives. Uh, he doesn't really, in general, it's not his thing. But I think to Sheila's point, this is the world we're in now. Well, and he seems to be reversing his legacy a little bit by restoring some of these. Yeah. What I what I think we need to do is not just go after the fox cons, but restore the historic tax credit, yes. some of the brownfield credits, all these little projects mm -hmm. that are all over Detroit. Uh, you know, an abandoned, you know, tool and die shop right. can be remade thanks to a tax credit. I think that's what we need, what I call the little guy tax credit. Yeah. I think, you know, for the, to support not just the huge project by Dan Well, and Gilbert. it's interesting because some people would say that they would rather have 100 companies with 100 employees than one company with 10,000, uh, that that's not really, uh, it's, not, it's just not really the solid foundation that you'd like to build your community on as much. Right. I think you, you can do both. I mean, I think you can, you, you can do both. <laughs> and uh, if you're going to do Fox, go at, by all means, go after Foxconn. Right. Right. And let Gilbert build the thing on the Hudson site, but that's that's do that abandoned school with an historic tax credit. Yeah, you know? I can remember having a conversation with George Jackson, the longtime head of economic development yeah. in the city, and he's, he said to me one time, he said, "I'd abate 100% of taxes as long as I can get the investment in the community." 
As long as we can get the people there, get the activity, get people getting, you know, getting paid, um, buying things, economic activity will take it. Now we've moved a little beyond that here, but I think that argument to some extent still holds. I do, I do think there time. should be more attention paid to sort of what is, w with the taxes that are not, that are, that are captured, what, what, what impact is that having on the general fund's ability to, to provide service? I think that's a fair question. Mm -hmm. I know my time on council, you could never get a straight answer. Uh, but I think, going. yeah, I mean, we just, what's the impact? What, <laughs> yeah, what does yeah. this mean? Because sometimes when you do these big developments, not only is there a tax capture, but they still put, require, the, 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 their existence creates needs that draw from the general fund services mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that are not part of the tax capture. So what's the impact? Uh, I think that's a fair, good policy-driven analysis that could, should be part of these projects. I know that's a lot uh, of thing, uh, in the thinking of our next guest. In fact, when we come back, Arthur Jemison is here to talk about what's going on in the neighborhoods where the rubber meets the road in so many ways. Stick around. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Gang, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure as always. You. All right, well, I'll keep the promise that I made going into the break. Yes, let's talk neighborhoods now with the director of Housing and Revitalization for the City of Detroit, Arthur Jemison. Arthur, great to have you this morning. Great to be here. You and I have had a number of conversations over the three years that you've been in Detroit, and I guess what I wanted to do was transfer one or two of those conversations to in front of the camera. Sure, today let's do it. To hear some of the things that you and I have talked about. And I want to start with your take when you hear, and by the way, we shopped together, clearly. I know. Hey, this we couldn't. We couldn't. <laughs> I must, the text must have worked. <laughs> We're adorable. Um, I, when you, though, hear people wanting to go down that road of it's, it's uh, one story in downtown and, and midtown and a completely different disconnected story in the neighborhoods, you say what? Oh, I, I, I say, um, well, the difference is planning. I say, um, when you think about the years of, that went into planning downtown and uh, Campus Martius, uh, all the other work that went in years before uh, any of us got here, um, and you, see, you start to see some of the results on the street as people are beginning to see in downtown and midtown, um, I think people say, well, why hasn't this happened in the neighborhoods? Um, uh, one of the things I noticed and one of the reasons I called a, a friend and colleague I'd worked with years before, Maurice Cox, and, and tried to invite him to come to the city was because I believe that our neighborhoods needed the same quality and level of planning. Uh, and the mayor, of course, uh, felt the same way. So um, and what Maurice, took, and Maurice, Maurice, uh, Maurice uh, <laughs> took the challenge. And um, what we've got now is we've got uh, the East Riverfront plans been rolled out. Uh, we've got four plans that are underway in neighborhoods right now and are coming to conclusion. One of the results of one of the early plans was the Fitzgerald neighborhood plan, where 116 uh, houses are being renovated and over 200 watts are being transformed with landscape, including a new park. Um, we're going to see more plans like that. They're custom to each neighborhood. It's an interesting thought because when you think about the way that a neighborhood develops, uh, mm -hmm. it often starts with one house, then there's two, then there's three, but you kind of improvise your way through it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have, it doesn't start with the level of planning that you're talking about. So now you're trying to retro engineer. Yes. Some that's of these correct. neighborhoods. That's exactly right. And in Fitzgerald, you know, 50, it's got to be 50 community meetings at this point, went into asking and soliciting residents' input about what should happen. And residents said, listen, uh, the demolition that was done here uh, was helpful, uh, but we want to know what comes next. And I think the answer has been um, we can be, we can do new things in this neighborhood. We can rehabilitate existing houses for uh, less than it would cost to build new construction. Uh, we can transform some of these vacant lots with landscape. Yeah. Uh, we can, um, and we can invite new residents here for, for both rental and for sale opportunities, and we can include more affordable housing in it too. You and Maurice both spend a lot of time thinking about landscaping and yes. the way things just sort of look. And I guess this mm -hmm. goes back to the broken windows theory, mm -hmm. that once something looks nice, people work harder to keep it nice. That's right, and I think that's what we're relying on in a neighborhood like Fitzgerald. Uh, what well, we selected a development team was going to, again, transform the landscape while they're transforming the houses and reoccupying them. Um, I mean, I think it just without getting into shop talk, as I tried not to do when we sit down, <laughs> you know, um, the resources it takes to transform uh, and create new affordable ho new housing, affordable or market, uh, it, it's, not, it's, not exp it's not cheap. Yeah. So uh, when, you, when you have to sit down and start penciling out what's the way to get the best value out of the resources we're allocating, uh, the rehabilitation of the landscape uh, looks like the right set of things. And if you can get a developer to maintain them, it'll work. Which, of course, takes us to follow the money. And mm -hmm. it, there's always money at the center of this and yes. trying to figure out how to get enough. I mean, there's 
heck, you've got hardly any problems you probably can't solve if you had enough money. True. First off, how uh -huh. confident are you there that we've got the access to the money we need? And um, your thoughts on uh, President Trump uh, mm -hmm. and what you understand so far about his budgeting and what that's going to mean for places like Detroit? Sure. So uh, we had the we had the benefit of having uh, Dr. Carson come visit the city, and we were able to speak with them directly about our city uh, and our city's needs. Um, you know, I would say that um, between meetings with the mayor and meetings with other local uh, electeds and local, um, uh, in, in fact, uh, we had meetings with pastors and others that were, were of great interest. We really made the case for how much impact the dollars that are being spent with CDBG, home, other programs are generating in our city. Uh, I believe there's approximately a one to five to one to seven ratio leverage ratio mm -hmm. that CDBG and home has, and I think that that was compelling. Uh, for the secretary. I heard later that he had asked other mayors to produce a similar exhibit. Um, I think having worked in government, different sides of government, different kinds of leadership, leadership I agreed with all the time, leadership I didn't agree with, um, I, I'm here, the mayor, we're all here to represent the city, and they're all, they're all presidents, they're all governors to us. We make our case for our city, what we need, demonstrate our capacity to use the money and allocate it well, and we'll, we'll get more. Um, so I, I think we're comfortable working with um, whoever they've got because we, we need to represent and wave the flag for our city and get the resources. Whoever we need. it is. Whoever it is. Anytime. Whoever it is. Uh, I, want to, I want to let you address a, a point that the mayor has really continuing, especially he talked about this a lot up at Mackinac. Yes. That he has this fierce belief that we have to have rich people living next to not so rich people, mm -hmm. white people living next to black people, mm -hmm. uh, this, that, that we have to somehow kind of create, uh, I don't want to call it an inorganic mm -hmm. uh, process, but he really believes that that's the way long term for us to be a happier, more better functioning place. Absolutely. That has to feed right into the way that, so how do you, how do you take your marching orders from that? Well, well, first of all, I take my marching orders to the mayor and I, I can tell you that we spent a lot of time together talking about this issue. He's very passionate about it, as, as I am and Maurice and other leadership are. Uh, we can build, uh, with the right resources and investments and partners, we can build that city. We can preserve existing uh, legacy Detroiters. We can preserve existing legacy affordable housing. Uh, we can build new housing, and that housing that we build that's new can include a place for everyone, specifically affordable housing and the new construction as well. You can see that in some of the recent news we've had. Uh, the, earlier this week, uh, the Michigan State Housing Development Authority announced four awards. Uh, 271 affordable housing units are going to be preserved and extended for 30 years, and another 114 new units will be developed. Fascinating. And I could talk to you about this stuff for about three more hours, but unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm going to have Maurice on. Uh, Already? Next okay. Time. I know. It goes fast, as, as, I, as I promised it would. Thank you so much for being on. We will continue this conversation. Absolutely. In a future edition of Flashpoint. Meet the press coming up next right after Mitch Alvis, Heart of Detroit. Have a great week. See you next time on Flashpoint.